All right, getting this wine flowing, baby. I'm about to be drinking wine from here until tonight. Yes. Hit you with that cheers so real quick. I got... It's the Marathon Podcast. <laughs> I've, I, I'm, a, I'm a pro marathon drinker now. Yeah, you build up the, you build up your stamina. You know, I guess. <laughs> There's one podcast. I think I started drinking Jameson at like 1 p.m. Yeah. And I did it for like the other two podcasts after that. Oh boy. It's actually a surprisingly good ride. Well, if you're like, I guess drinking water too, then you're like, all right. Well, I definitely wasn't. It was straight like Jamie and, and Coke. <laughs> so just, bad. Just riding that JMO wave. I know. You got water if you, if you need yeah, something. Yeah, I got you. Know. I got you. Yeah. I just got, got this perfect little size for putting in my pocket. Hey. Yeah, you biked here. Yeah, it was nice. I'm worried that it's going to rain on the way home, but I brought mm. my rain gear. Nice. Right, so what's up, guys? Welcome back to That Single. I'm here with Michael Bryan. Hello. What's going on, man? I just rode over here, and I'm sitting down, drinking wine with you. Hey. <laughs> appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah, I... <sighs> I'm so glad I didn't sell my car to get a Vespa because getting here with all my podcast gear had been such bitch. What kind of car do you have? It's like a normal Hyundai Sonata, you know, normal four-door trunk. I have a 98 Toyota Camry. Wow. It's perfect. <laughs> do you get pulled over a lot in that thing? No, but things fall off of it because, like, people hit the side view mirror all the time or, like, dude, park into it. And just, I don't care anymore. My left rear view mirror is just... A shell of what it used to be. The, I imagine the mechanism doesn't move it around anymore. No, it actually does, but oh, the plastic nice. that went around the glass is just gone. It's literally just a, it's literally just the mirror. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's it has like a bionic looking ear on it or something. Yeah, it's exposed. It's the ex, it's the in, inner skeleton of your car. Yeah, I know. But dude, Mike, so I got to give you props, man. I respect the fuck out of what you do. Oh, thank you. Like the events that you've that you've done that I've been to, your artwork personally, but for me and how I've been modeling my art events, I've been looking a lot at what you do oh. and using that as inspiration. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just want to take a moment to big up you because you've like inspired <laughs> like a lot of the structure and the approach that I've taken for some of my shit. Oh, cool. Well, thank you. And I can't take total credit for uh, like the idea of a group art show and everything, but. I do like that you recognize certain things about it that you wanted to uh, adapt into how you present work. I imagine, like, I'd, I'm actually really curious what parts of it you do like. Yeah, so the first time I got exposed to you was your first solo show at your Hole in the Sky Collective, mm -hmm. which I have many questions about. But um, And I had never been to that space. I'm familiar with, like, that area, but I had never been to that space. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. Like, this was one of... It was one of the few art shows I was like, this feels like someone in this room made this happen. And I thought the space was really cool, too. Uh, and I, I, I liked your artwork there, too. But then you did the lowbrow, and I was like, that was fucking next level. That was honestly my favorite art show of 2019. Oh, awesome. Yeah. That's really nice to hear. Thank you. Uh, if you liked that, then like you would have loved all the shows that we used to do at Hole in the Sky. Because what you saw at Hole in the Sky was like my solo show um but up until that point i primarily focused on organized group gr organizing group art shows much like the lowbrow in invitational at hole in the sky so like oh. there's a whole series of shows that began in like 2012 that was oh. labeled art show one like we serialized it right off the bat because we knew we were going to want to keep bringing artists from outside of our space uh, and even like outside of our city mm -hmm. together to show it all off because I always thought that there was lots of great stuff happening, but no one was ever really like pulling it together to like celebrate it. So wow. that was uh, like what I wanted to do when I got a studio space that had the resources to put on shows. It's a big space that, that hole in the sky too. Yeah, it was super cool because... Like, I knew that it could host people because I'd been going to punk shows, like music, there. And as a result of that, like, I saw that, like, people knew how to get there. They liked the space. The space could host people. Um, and then, like, I was moving into the city. I was really into screen printing. I wanted to set up a studio somewhere that wasn't my apartment. 
And I was just paying attention to Hole in the Sky, their website and email list. And they posted that they were like building out artist studios. So I like reached out and just expressed my interest, talked about how I like had all the screen printing equipment. One of the guys there, Sean Berg, was a screen printer himself. Oh, wow. And they had just gotten a bunch of screen printing equipment uh, from this shop that uh, wasn't using it anymore. They weren't trying to sell it. They just needed to store it somewhere. And so, like, we were, they were cool with us, like, setting it up and, like, using it. Uh, That's when, epic. Yeah. So it was, like, a great, like, point in time when, like, I was really excited about screen printing. And then, like, the space and the opportunity and the resources. Get my closer to you. And the, like, other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Let me yeah. adjust. Yeah. Um, the, like the space the people and the resources were all coming together and so like i moved my moved in to have a studio there i didn't move in to live i just like got one of these studio spaces and that allowed me to help build out the screen printing like booth area like the things you really need are like a washout booth like a dark room and Mm -hmm. like an exposure unit to really properly do screen printing and then like uh table to print on and like I had a vacuum table that it made so put all that together and like so so you didn't you didn't start holding the sky collective you kind of joined it joined into it yeah oh I always thought that you were the founder of it oh no 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 it'd been uh existed well before me like I think started like 2008 and it was much more of like a punk space it still doesn't take away from anything i think about you no 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 it's it's very cool like but like yeah it was effectively like um leading the charge of art events like Mm. from like 2012 to 2000 16 or something really you so you started doing group art shows or just art general since 2012 yeah holy shit man yeah it's been going on i was actually hanging out with a couple friends one who used to live at hole in the sky um and also had his studio um and like built bikes and did really cool bike stuff i was having beers with him and another guy who like participated in group art shows at hole in the sky last night and we were talking about it and like According to like my calculations, Hole in the Sky has been around for over a decade, which Whoa. is like freaky. Like it's yeah. super cool um, that a place will continue to like be able to exist and be like very low key um, while still being able to do like relatively big things yeah. within the community. Yeah, because I mean, I've only been a part of the DC art scene and like attending the art events for maybe like three, two, three years now. Probably, probably like two and a half, three, whatever. And you guys were, you you and your shows that I've seen um, are like really well coordinated. They're well thought out. Um, like the spaces are really nice too. Yeah, you seem to have your 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 finger on the pulse with a lot of these things. Well, I mean, it, it's definitely from a lot of practice. Like um, yeah. over the years, and like over the, I guess the dozens of shows that I've done, like you learn what you like and what you don't like and you just sort of keep building on that and so Mm -hmm. it's always felt effectively the same like every time to me (laughs) like what what made you want to start doing these art shows because i feel like the city doesn't really see much of that and if you're talking Mm -hmm. about it in 2012 it makes me think probably no one was doing it no because someone was like people were doing it there was like um, art wino at the time was organizing these like group shows that you could participate in and they were basically just like developers like had a space that they needed to like draw Mm -hmm. people to and like host events at to like um advertise it and um like shane uh who was the guy who ran art wino was just like working with them and he really loved art and like reached out to artists and then just like brought people in and it was just like pretty much anybody could participate um but like i liked that but i didn't like that it was like for the like developer to like advertise their space at the end of the day yeah it was for them to use the situation to kind of oh look at our space and draw audience it wasn't someone like you or me who's doing events and we're saying this is for the culture 
well thought out, not with like this weird sort of agenda. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you're, you're kind of hitting it on the head. Like I wanted to do something where like one, like it wasn't about anything except just like the showing off of creative stuff that like people are inspired by and they made and stuff. And two, like the people who are selling their artwork, like being able to like keep the profits of like selling their artwork instead of having to like do a split with like the organizer, the gallery, which was like very idealistic and like, like just whatever. I didn't, wasn't doing it for money or whatever, but like the hole in the sky shows were always like the artists get 100% of like the sale. And it was always like trying to just like not even be a middleman, just sort of like introduce the buyers yeah. to the artists and just like see that them make their arrangements. That's the hard tight rope that I'm walking on when I do events is because I don't walk into them think I'm going to get rich or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But I, you do want to be compensated for your time and efforts. Yeah. And I've learned that over time that it actually does make sense for there to be a split, a reasonable split. Same. I came to that conclusion too. As long as the like organizer of the gallery is doing like the work, that's the value that they're providing. And that is represented by like the split of the money that they get. Like, I don't like it when a gallery is just like taking a split because they're a gallery and they don't actually provide anything like to help you make a thing happen. And if they just like sort of like do very like non-committal promotion for an event or something like yeah, because they don't market you at all. If they don't have like a good sort of marketing apparatus or like thing that they brand or anything, yeah, like you can justify a proper like forty sixty split if you're like really providing a lot to like get people to come and buy your work. Yeah, but like I don't know, some people would just like treat it too casually or like don't express i think it would make more sense if galleries and organizers just like clarified like more like what the split sort of like covers like rather Mm. than just having it be like an umbrella like gallery takes commission make it be a little like sort of educate people a little bit more because like not everybody understands why that is yeah and the problem with the galleries is that they don't necessarily have a brand most of the time like something that you've built that whole kind of collective as well is you've built a brand of successful shows fun engaging things so Someone might not know the artist, but they know you. They know Hole in the Sky. They know the space. Like, oh, well, whoever this is, it might be tight. Let me just go anyways. Yeah. As opposed to the gallery, if you're just some dude in the gallery for the first time, they're not going to do any marketing for you. It might be just your family and a couple of your friends, and you're like, fuck, like, this was cool, but what what did I really do here? Yeah, I mean, a proper gallery would have a reputation and have, like, a stable of buyers that like come out to everything that they put on. Like maybe that's what it is that they offer. Right. Yeah. That's what a gallery that's taken like a proper split, uh, should be doing like, cause if they're doing that, then they're making it happen. Yeah. Right? But if they're not doing that, then they're not get they're not doing like 40% of it. Maybe they more like a 20 or like a 15 or 10. I don't know. But, but those like, shows suck. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. Not, not all of them. Right. But the ones I've been to in DC, all of the like name brand galleries, the like white wall. Yeah, I've never enjoyed the experience. When I go to, and I'm gonna point the lowbrow. I fucking thought that was so cool, man. Like, yeah, it felt like a vibe. It was in the, it was in a warehouse. It was uh, great. The art was curated, was curated nicely. Mm. The vibe was curated nicely. The, even just the layout of the experience was mm. nice. You know, I paid attention to that. Most people probably don't, but I was like, the way you segmented it, even if it's subconsciously there, like even if you don't notice it, but it's guiding your actions yeah like that's a that's a success like mm-hmm. the fact that you do notice it because you're a person who thinks about those things and like you appreciate it is like awesome but like yeah i don't expect everyone to see it <laughs> no because because i did a show after you at the same spot uh-huh. for a collab for an exhibition for myself it was just an exhibition that uh was called create your fate my buddy trent bar worked on it it was just us we collabed on all the pieces mm-hmm. and I took a lot of cues from your lowbrow. I was like, oh, they set it up like this. They had people do this. Mm-hmm. And, oh, they had this, um, the DJ was here and all this stuff. And so I was like, and when I was at your lowbrow, I was like, damn, there was hundreds of people in there. Yeah. Well, anytime I'm setting up a show, the main thing that I do over and over again when it's like, as they were setting it up, is just like walk through it as if I was somebody who's experiencing it for the first time. Mm. And so... 
directional signage and other types of cues that you put into the space to <laughs> show people where the bathroom is, like <laughs> show people where to buy artwork, um, where to engage like a sales representative basically. And like where the space is that like individual artists are selling their merch so that people understand they can engage directly with them and also know that like if they have questions about the art, they're looking to meet the artist, there's a good chance they'll be over where the artists are hanging out. And also just trying to make myself visible as a person that's effectively like a docent, but like just like the main organizer of the show knows the most about all the artists who are involved in it and can direct anybody who has a question or just wants to meet the artist to them. And that's like the role I play during the show is basically like host, docent. Um, what do you mean docent? Yeah. What does that mean? Docent's like the person at a museum or a gallery uh, who okay. tells you like what's up or like hey. you can ask for information. Okay. And so like uh, you kind of try to serve as the like expert person. Like like the person in the video game who's sitting there, what do I do? Go there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like they'll just give you background on like, <laughs> yeah. your situation, why you're here. <laughs> I love the merch table thing you did there too. Mm-hmm. Because that's something I think every artist should have is other different merchandise than their artwork. Yeah. And the fact that you gave them each a space, I was like, oh, that's really nice. Well, that's totally modeled off of just going to punk shows and other like concerts where bands, like they have multiple revenue streams at their shows. Like the primary one is the ticket sales, but you know, there's only so many tickets you can sell. But like you can make more money in a night by just having like merchandise that you can sell. Um, and so it's also another touch point to like engage with the artist, especially if they're selling their stuff directly. Uh, and so like visual art has the same capacity and the same like kind of fandom that is generated yeah. like in the people who come and, like, so basically if I had to like distill it down a lot of the like inspiration for how the hole in the sky shows and like the lowbrow invitational the structured, like the ways that you experience it, are based on like my experiences going to like shows at Black Cat or like DC oh, Nine or makes sense. any like houses and stuff like that. If you substitute the the band performance for the artist yeah. and have a visual component, yeah, it all is very much the same. Yeah, and then like an extra thing you can do as a part of a show, like an opening reception, is to have some sort of like performance occur around like nine o'clock or something. Like, did that happen at Lowbrow? No, but like, oh, if I wanted to spice it up. Like I would do that because like it gives people a reason to stick around to a point and then like gives them something to like chill and talk about after that point. It's like right in the middle. Like Interesting that you're putting it at the middle. Yeah. I mean the hole in the sky shows, we started out doing them like seven o'clock to 11 o'clock and they would just get so crowded that we just pushed up the start time to like five o'clock to go to five to 11 because there's different types of people who want to experience art in different types of ways. Yeah. And so like your five to seven o'clock crowd are like your early birds, like who they, they don't got plans want, or something. And they don't want to be around a fuck ton of people. They actually want to like see the art and like experience it in their own time. I remember that. Because like after a certain point, like the hole in the sky, hole in the sky is much smaller than like the lowbrow invitation was at the Cheshire. So it's like huge giant warehouse. And then my thunder shark show was much smaller because it's just like a single solo person rather than like a group show. Mm. Kind of like a group show. Every artist, you can kind of just like assume that 10 people want to come see their thing. So if you have like 220 artists, you get like 200 people just like automatically coming to the show. And that's why like the group shows were always a great idea because like it automatically gets a lot of people to come out who are all similarly like-minded and, uh, uh, are going to enjoy what they see. Yeah, I figured that out because <clears throat> when I was trying to compare my turnout at the same venue, the Cheshire, the near Lowbrow, I was like, he had so many artists who each have their individual mm-hmm. families and different crowds and their different best friends and different girlfriends. And networks of people. And mm-hmm. like when you, especially now, you could you create like a base set of like promotional assets that you put out, but then everyone else is able to share that. And so like proliferates to a certain amount of people automatically organically as they say mm, yeah no 100 percent for sure it's but it's interesting that you said that you, you do the performance at the beginning so i'm organizing uh someone's solo show on march 27th which of course i'd love to have you there cool. um because it's in some ways 
when is it you inspired that uh march 27th it's like a friday night okay cool yeah yeah um he is very much involved in the punk scene you might know him, chris suspect yeah yeah he's he invited some punk bands to play that night on the second floor because the venue is like the first floor is the art gallery but on the second floor is just we don't i never know what Wait, to do with it which floor which gallery which space it's called spacey cloud oh on you know, the 18th yeah yeah didn't um henry henry had a thing yeah i produced that okay so was that your first one there or have so you done more? that was the first show that i produced under my branding that's the angle kind of like this podcast right but i had produced my show before that and uh another show before that but that was the first one i put my official like stamp on okay um uh yeah but even at henry's we had that second floor and we didn't know what the fuck to do with it so yeah i gotta come see that spot maybe i could like give you some like recommendations because yeah i mean I, I'm, I'm super open to it because the second floor we had some djs but no one went upstairs so you had music going on but you didn't have like anything else to pull them up yeah so hmm. so and the dj was just playing we had him playing from 9 to 11 uh-huh but now with Chris, we're having a whole separate punk show happen at 11. Oh, cool. So it's like 7 to 11, and then at 11, you can go upstairs and yeah. enjoy an epic punk rock show. That'll be cool. So that's kind of like that, but it's unique to that show. Is that for his book? Yeah, it's his book release party in an exhibition. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Chris has had a lot of like good shows. He had one at like the Leica store a couple several years ago that was like phenomenal really yeah he's got a lot of great photos and does a great job displaying them like he really thinks about it he dude he does when, when i went in there to give him the tour of his space he mm. literally had his ar app and he like mapped it on his oh. computer to lay out the the photos i was like what the fuck chris <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> like usually we just figure this out the day before <laughs> no i like that because for the thunder shark show I did like a mini model, a scale model. <laughs> Holy shit. Made it out of like paper and like to mapped out what the layout of the Thunder Shark show was going to be well in advance. So I knew how much artwork I needed to make to make it feel filled out. So maybe I could share something that I've learned mm -hmm. is that with Chris's show and the things that I'm doing with that's the angle is that I'm trying to approach it from an affordability standpoint and accessibility of artwork. Yeah. And I learned a lot from from cues from Henry's stuff. Mm -hmm. And with Chris, I said, Chris, look, I know you're collected. I know you're a big time photographer. You've exhibited all over the world. No one coming to this show has five hundred, a thousand dollars for your shit. I said, so why don't we do this? We're gonna display a couple of your big main pieces, and the rest of the pieces are gonna be prints. But they won't affect your gallery sales, just just prints, but we're gonna present them differently so that way there's different price points to hit. Yeah. So I'm like, let's keep those prints at like a $30 and below level. And they can still feel very nice. You could sign them and do whatever. And it, and even then, because there's not much space, it'll actually help you have a more of a visual experience because it's not all these 13 by 19 and giant pieces you have. Yeah. It's like a, you have a few of those and then you have these small prints filling in the gaps and it's more kind of collagey than it is just one row of photos across the whole gallery. Yeah. I mean, that was exactly how I thought about the thunder shark show was i had basically three different sizes of art that um actually like four but like i knew that i wanted to have things that were like 50 dollar range all the way up through like a thousand dollars like one thing that was like a thousand dollars like four things that are like four hundred dollars mm -hmm. and then like 40 things that were between like 250 and $50 that way, like there was something for everybody. But even then I found that 50 is almost too much. I, I mean, it all depends. Did on, it work for you that night? Yeah. It all depends like what career stage you're at true, as an artist true. And, and what level of like value you can command based on like your reputation and, what's obvious about like how much time you've spent developing your individual style as an artist. Cause that's, mm. that's where the, the ability to charge more for something that doesn't, that, that someone else wouldn't feel as confident doing like charging that much like comes from. It's just like, I know it's worth this much cause it took me this much time to do and I want to get paid this much time f for my time. And yeah. like, it comes out to that. Like, and that's the math that like I do on pricing anymore. So mm. Kind of like more of a practical thing. The wall I, I 
ran in with that, at least in my mind, I, I'm sure you've been, you have way more experience than I do, is that, like, at least from what I've seen with Henry's is that he sold his shit in 1999, which was stupid, but he just had so much shit he was trying to get rid of. And $19.99. It was like also an Ikea themed concept, yeah. which okay. was really cool. Yeah. He sold fucking everything. Yeah. But it told me that an average Joe who doesn't know shit about art, because you can't assume they know that, right? Mm-hmm. That they want to buy it. They want to feel involved. They want to collect, but they're not trying to spend 50, a hundred dollars. So when I saw that, I said, Maybe I could come up with a new approach here. Yeah. And like at that point, you're basically talking about the price point of merch and like something that's like $40 or less tends to be like the price point of merch True. rather than like a piece of art that you're like mm. paying for. That's like, it's, you got to find a point at which it becomes one thing from, from the other. Yeah. And like if you're trying to make money selling things um at a lower price point you have to do it at a certain volume and like once it becomes like a volume game i consider it something that you think of more like merch true um or a product Mm. so to keep a thing an art piece i try to like keep it at a certain price point that's not like accessible because it's not like reproducible and like i see what you're saying you know what i mean yeah it's I mean, kind of like the idea of doing mono prints rather than like a run of like 50 posters. Like, would you consider a concert poster that's silkscreen printed a run of like one, one, uh, 100 of them, like that you buy an individual print for $40? Like, that's cool, but I wouldn't consider that like a piece of art. I'd consider that a piece of like merch. Yeah, it is merch. Yeah. And then like you look at the numbers on that, it's like, so they made 100 of them. Let's just say they straight up sold all of them for forty dollars, and they made four thousand dollars. It's a fat margin. There's other th- that's gross. Like, but yeah, without the production costs. Yeah. But even then, you're probably taking home like three thousand on that. Hopefully, yeah. Um, but then, like, you think about okay, how do I do that with like art? Like, how do I make three thousand dollars? Or like four thousand dollars selling art, mm. and so it's like, if I want to sell something for four hundred dollars, I need to sell ten of those to make the same amount of money as I would selling like merchandise. So yeah. it's a weird numbers game. It is, and, and so that's why you got to like push prices up because you want to push volume down so that you can focus on individual pieces to inject as much value into an individual piece as possible it makes me think i might sell or we might sell the pieces on the walls for a little bit more than i was thinking Mm -hmm. maybe go to like a 40 dollar price point yeah or a 35 dollar price point Mm -hmm. but then like something i'm helping chris with is i'm working with uh to develop like custom merch for that night yeah whether it's like shirts or buttons yeah and stuff like that because Mm -hmm. anyone that i'm associating with i want to make sure like they're rounded for that show yeah you know, so we're working with like Chris Cardi, homie of mine, who's a local designer, mm-hmm. and he's kind of helping to collaborate and take care of that. That's good. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's, it's the numbers game on art and like at this level in particular is like yeah. daunting. Uh, and I've never found a way to make it like a, a living, like wage type situation so what do you mean dude you crushed it at lowbrow dude i know you made a lot of money at lowbrow i mean but then if i'm trying to like make a certain like living and i have to do a lowbrow invitational like every month like Uh, to like make that kind of living and then have to treat it more like a real business instead of just like a fun side project which who knows maybe that is a good idea to like try to pursue that maybe that is like a thing that i'm well positioned to do but like the events game is a, it's like, a, then you're like an event producer, more right? Than like an art show organizer. That's what I'm like tiptoeing on is like, it, that's, it, and that's, that's what the likes of like, uh, Peter Chang and no Kings collective. Like that's what those guys are doing. And like, that's who I am trying to like reach like that level. You should get them on the show. Dude, do you understand? It's so fucking hard to get them on the show. They're just busy people. They're so busy because it's a hard job. Last year I was really on them. 
but I think now I have a better chance because the podcast looks a little better now. Yeah, you've got now you've talked to a lot of people, so like it makes you look more like you're taking it seriously and they're not yeah. wasting their time talking to you. Like, who's this guy? Ah, fuck him. This, this guy, just some random podcaster. <laughs> I'm like, nah, man, I've, it's, it's no, been over I've a year it. now. I've done a lot of them. It's yeah. like, no, it's been over a year, bro. We ain't going nowhere. I'm I promise. taking it seriously. <laughs> they're kind of like the Everest right now for me in this area. Like, to get them on will be such just it'll feel good to me no one else will give a shit but for me it'll feel good i'm sure it's only a matter of time have you talked to charlie at all charlie viscanage oh yeah he's def. so it's so funny when we were at dc art studios he was like yeah i'll be on your show and i kind of was like eh, i just kind of like, ah, i don't know the fuck you are but now that i've like, experienced charlie yeah. over the past few years I'm like i fucking love charlie i definitely want to have him on the show just have because he did sheet cake and then he did fun land and then he just did like another thing so he's very active and yeah i doing- know interactive art experiences he's he's definitely like the next few weeks i'm gonna be reaching out to him yeah he's in japan right now i saw that sweet. yeah why is it, do you know why he's over there he's got like a little artist residency no way yeah he's just like really good at like applying for these things he's like hustles at that and then gets to like go travel and like do a residency and then come back inspired how's he how did he even find that it's so rare this is websites so they're, like, even, they're out there even sarah's talking about that she was like applying for grants and walls and stuff i'm just i'm very like oh, i haven't applied for one what are you talking about <laughs> yeah well there's like i know wpa just uh announced the wherewithal grants that are funded by like the um what is it andy warhol foundation and so there's like money that people are making available for people to pursue projects and you should apply to them. What? So is it like the website WPA? Uh, you know, the the, the gallery WPA, uh-uh. um, or artist org- arts organization. They're kind of like um, Transformer Gallery. You know them? Is Transformer a nonprofit? Yeah. Okay. They're also got a lot of funding from the Andy Warhol Foundation. Uh, I'm trying. This podcast needs some funding from the goddamn Andy Warhol Foundation. Yeah, you should. Well apply to the where with all grant because like i mean they're probably more focused on like an art project but like you could frame this as an art project that is something that's good for the community because i think the grants are for like things that bring the community together so like oh snap yeah so i think there's plenty of ways that you could frame like the thing that you're doing the episodes that you've recorded the community that you're building and informing like there's a need for that and it should be paid for by somebody <laughs> right it should be i mean i would love a sponsor or some sort of funding just to help me because if i could focus more on this shit would get so much better yeah i mean you gotta start somewhere and then just work your way up and wow. like you're doing that foundational work right now but real quick what's that what's that like how would i find that and i guess they're on instagram it's just wpa yeah like wpa and I'm saying that for myself and for anyone listening who's like kind of curious about these things. Yeah, I'll just look it up to confirm. Ah, no, no worries. Dude, we can do that later. Don't worry about it. It's easy enough. But it seems like you kind of tiptoe a similar line like I do. Maybe you some more where it's like, do I go be more of an artist or do I be more of an events producer? Uh, where do you sit on that line? Be more of an artist or be more of an event producer. I kind of like started doing event production so that i could make posters to promote the shows and like making posters and wheat pasting posters around town was kind of my artistic expression so i was kind of doing both so it's hard to say Mm -hmm. from my perspective that i actually made a choice to do one or the other Um, but i think now i'm trying to find more of a balance of both where 2019 i did the solo show which was my first solo show ever Congrats, and awesome. i did the lowbrow invitational and that was because i had been so focused on just organizing shows that like i decided that i had sort of like smothered my like ego to a point that was like <laughs> not necessarily the right thing to do because like i didn't want to like draw attention to myself necessarily but then i started realizing that like to be successful as an artist, a lot of patrons of artists really need to connect with the artist themselves. And so you need to like develop your ego into something that people can resonates with people. That's a weird realization, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was weird. Cause I was like very resistant to it for a very long time. You Uh, seem like a shy dude too. 
Like, yeah, yeah. You don't, you're not like me where you're like, give me all the fucking clout. Like, you seem more like, nah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would be an accurate description. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to that. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheers to that one, man. Yeah, I'll take it all. <sighs> Tasty. Huh, it's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, personally, my art event ambitions are pretty ambitious like my art event goals are pretty ambitious like i'd love to have a no king size or no king scale art show Mm -hmm. produced by that c angle do you know like why you want to do that so the why for what i'm doing now and the and the art shows i'm doing now is because i simply enjoy them and and it provides an escape of an alternative to doing something on the weekends mm-hmm. it's a di- it's an alternative to something that's not your generic let's go drink at johnny pistolos or whatever it is it's 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 something different than your go to the club or go to the nightclub and spend a bunch of money it's a new experience where you can engage with other people that's similar to you and then also you know helping artists like i really enjoy the fact that at henry show there was no one talking to me it was so nice the mm-hmm. fact that i could just sit there and just help and make things run smoothly mm-hmm. and have him just shine and have his moment like yeah it felt so good to help him out like that. And, and I've never been a generous person at all, but like, I felt really good about that. And I was like, damn, like this feels nice. Like to help him almost launch what he's doing, because since then he's done so many amazing things. And I could see this crazy momentum he's gotten off of that because of how much work I put on the back end is for marketing and, and making sure the branding was good and making sure it was organized. Like, and the fact that now him, like he's making good money now, like he's I'm like, wow, it's amazing. So, you know, like me helping Chris and stuff, it feels good, even though Chris is kind of way more established. It's still going to be a fun time for anyone who goes to that that night. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there is that is like the most satisfying thing about organizing shows is uh, bridging the gap for people between like having something that's really cool and like wanting to show it to people, but not knowing how and like creating a place for them to show it to people in an environment that like people know what to do with it. Mm. Like, um, even just like fundamental stuff of like how to like properly frame and light something when you're displaying it for people it doesn't come naturally to every artist. Like a lot of artists are really great at making the piece, but then not at showing the piece. Like, uh, and then like, people who feel like they don't have the opportunity to do it like to be that person that has created that opportunity for them is like super satisfying and to see them like then have the confidence because of that thing to like do bigger and better things is also like the super most satisfying thing about like organizing shows i mean but don't get me wrong i think if done correctly you can make good money from it oh absolutely you know like if if you can have an event and charge 10 bucks to get in and 300 people come that's a good return on your investment, not including the fact that if you are getting a split off the bar or if you even own the bar yeah. or if you have sponsorship dollars in there, like all of a sudden your event could be, you know, that could sustain you for six months or, or even a few months to your next event or, you know, just give you time to focus on something. So it's like if I was to profit off of an event, it's not purely greed. It's because now I can focus on this stuff. Yeah, that's actually like defining like the tangible revenue streams and like being like the business model for doing a thing is like the biggest challenge, the biggest yeah, hurdle really. So hard. Um, and like there are certain variables that are easier to come by than others. Like <laughs> the space in which to like put on a show is like the biggest variable and like <sighs> space the cost is associated everything. with that is like that automatically there can just sort of like, take half of everything that would be like earned from doing a show because it's like the space really is the most important thing <laughs> dude it is it's finding like the ideal space yeah which is why the cheshire was so perfect because i'm sure you went with the model that was just pay the thousand and and have yeah. the night yeah so much it was obvious that was a better choice i don't remember what the other option was like a split or like some weird shit it was a split where you get uh, like thirty percent of the ticket sales, you get no bar sales, and they take a cut of your art sales. It's yeah. pretty much like a low investment if you aren't really established kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. There, working with them was an interesting uh, journey because 
they ha- didn't really have their terms like really well defined and they were kind of just like defining them as we like mm-hmm. continued. And, uh, I mean, that's part of the learning experience. That was kind of like the thing that ho- makes hole in the sky. So made it so easy was that like it eliminated like so many things I have to think about and also had like a built in, like a set of like volunteers who helped run shows and like watch the door. Dude, and that part's like so that. important is having people help staffing. You. Yeah. The staffing of it. Cause it's like, if it's a free show and you ask them to help you, they're like, can you pay me? And you're like, Oh fuck. It's a free show, dude. Like, I don't where's know the money coming from. Yeah. Where's the money coming from. But if you're charging at the door, it's like, okay, sure. I can pay you a hundred bucks. Yeah. And so I, I've, I've always in, in support of like the donations or just like straight up tickets at the door, depending on what you want to call it. But it's the same thing of people giving money to get in. And like, yeah, it's better to do that because then it means that like people are probably going to stick around a little bit longer when they get in. <laughs> like they're not do, just going to like pop in and then pop out. Do you think I'm fucking up by making the Chris, like the Henry show is free. The Chris suspect show is free. Do you think I'm messing up there? Um, I think you could capture at least $5 from people on the way in. It's the same, like a bar having a cover for a band. Like, so our model was like, or is, you know, free show charge you to see the band. But do you think it'd be better to be like, I would just like charge for the show and you get to see the band as part of that, like entry fee. And you could choose not to see like, how much are you charging for the band? For the uh, show. I think we had settled on like 10 bucks, but even then I kind of felt like that was a, like a little much. I mean, people are willing to pay 10 bucks to go to a thing anymore. Like 10 bucks is the new $5. <laughs> is it really? I think so. Cause it's like, it's like you can come in and enjoy that. But then it's like at 11, it's like, Oh, you want to go upstairs? Give us 10 bucks. I kind of feel like, I don't a, like that. It, it, I don't like, awkward. yeah, it does feel awkward. Cause it's like, Oh wait, you're already here. You never want to make the transactional feeling like it can be transactional once, but it can't be like, transactional over and over again it's just like yeah I want, i'm here to like have a good time like I'm not here to like keep getting like money taken from me <laughs> like yeah. when i didn't expect it like the most upfront that it can be is preferable and like yeah i've always benefited from like shows being able to be like byob and like never really worrying about shows making money like shows that hole in the sky like made door sales and that was like great because we'd have like a lot of people come through but it was never like an excessive like amount of money that was like being generated because we never wanted it to be something that like competed with legitimate businesses like hole in the sky has never been like a legitimate business so like if we were selling alcohol i feel like we would have been shut down very quickly because like there are bars that have licenses that like worked really hard to get them and to maintain them. Dude, that shut down my first exhibition. Which one? A couple years ago, I did my first exhibition up at this place called Uptown Art House. Yeah. And me being not knowing anything, doing my first event, first solo show, I just completely did it myself, willed this shit into existence. Yeah. I was like, oh, I want to make money off the bar. So I had a bar and it was like just wine and beer. Yeah. And I was like, oh, it's donation. But of course it never goes smoothly. So we actually got busted by the ABC cops. Oh, fuck. Yeah. And they shut the party down like at 11 when like the rave was supposed to happen. Damn. And so I learned since then, but like at Spacey Cloud, they have a licensed bar. Yeah. So they give me the space. But of course they're like, oh yeah, if people are here, they're going to buy drinks, which is true. Yeah. But I really like what you're saying of that pain point of it's going to be awkward when we're sitting at the bottom of the stairs like, oh, uh, it's $10. But if I just say, yo, five bucks at the door yeah, and you get free access to a punk show whether you want to go or not. Yeah. And you could still make it 10 bucks at the door. But like it, it all depends what you want. But like I don't think that's like too much to ask for a art show and a punk music show like for 10 bucks. That's a great deal. <laughs> I think you just changed my mind on that. I think I'm actually going to. Even though we kind of just dropped it, but no one's really got done anything yet. Like it's still very loose this far out. I think I might actually try reframing it and being like, yo, Chris, let's just do 10 bucks at the door and we'll give a band a percentage. Yeah. Like that's more like a more traditional, like more of like how people like expect it to go. Like, I think so too, because if you pay 10 bucks for the art show, but then you, and you get a punk rock show, you're probably more likely to stay for the show as opposed to 
do you see the show and then you leave at 11 when a punk show shuts because you don't give a fuck about the punk show yeah yeah i think I god think- damn it mike thank you <laughs> you're an angel man dude can you cheers me on that one thank sure. you you completely changed my life on this event i probably had a disaster on my Just hands keep it as simple as possible like never overcomplicate it when it comes to like just making it so that people like people don't want to think about shit like but i don't know man you you're the og on this shit man you know like, i don't well figure this out i think like just be a clear communicator like let them know what they're getting is like a excellent curation of visual art like that they can be around and have drinks in and hang out with interesting people and then at 11 o'clock there's a punk show that's happening um that's all like curated by the artist whose work you're like looking at like that's an event like there's multifaceted there's so many things like awesome things going on where it's like yo shit we can go rock out or we can just stay down here yeah i mean people pay 10 bucks for way less (laughs) you know you're right you're so right if you get a show and an art you get an art show an amazing art show and a punk show on the like that seems yeah you're right yeah and it'd be cool if like the bar would have some kind of like drink special or something oh of course yeah and then that just farther like makes the cost of admission make sense well that's why the venue like loves me so much because they're like oh my god we did so well at your henry show you get people in on like a dead night like what day of the week is it gonna be friday oh it's not dead night but like maybe they don't usually draw people on a friday like, well it's not packed to the walls exactly on a friday night yeah. for them. that's why any place has like a venue or like poke or like trivia or like, <laughs> shit, like fucking to get people to come in trivia. and have drinks like yeah. a reason to be there that's not just that it's a bar that's why that like that bar that always like transformed into some kind of like game of thrones thing or like christmas bar on in shaw like that's why oh, they were yeah. doing that it's because like oh it's different now so like oh let's go see it oh that that bar that always rotates every season yeah they crush it there's always a line down the fucking block. yeah it did really well but they're closed forever now the way they are the yeah, miracle on sixth street the owner just like decided it wasn't worth it. they're like burned out on it i think like they burned really hot because like you know why would they quit that that seems so successful i think they were running out of like they ran into issues with like copyright infringement on like uh, major ip like game of thrones and then they started doing like more generic things that just weren't as interesting to people because they didn't have the association with like a really cool like intellectual property that everyone knows you know i guess it's better just to go out while you're hot than go out being lame yeah you know? yeah you don't want it to like <laughs> all of a sudden just be like really pathetic and gross <laughs> <laughs> they probably they probably saw the trajectory and they're just like let's pull out it's done that's smart yeah oh that's interesting yeah i had no idea what was going on with that every time i drive by it which is literally every time i drive my car because it's down the street for me mm-hmm. i'm like oh i always think of the dates i went there and it was so fun and how much i spent for those stupid sweet ass drinks i never made it in i never went dude but... the drinks were so expensive dude oh gross it was literally You'd pay $15 for a sweet drink, and they took your ID because the mug they gave you was, like, a really cool mug, which was kind of tight. Uh-huh. And it, but the experience was fun, but the drinks were, like, unique, but they're just really sweet. But um, I don't like it, it was a good experience. It was yeah. a good experience. I don't like sweet drinks. I would be insulted. I would be like, <laughs> unless it's, like, a tiki drink. Oh, I love Even tiki then, drinks. I like them to only be sweet because they've got, like, a rum in them, not because they've got, like, a ton of sugar added. Uh, I feel like that's like the 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 yin and the yang you get. If you want a tiki drink, it's gonna be sweet. Yeah, but I want it to be sweet because it's just full of rum. <laughs> <laughs> you think rum and is like, sweet? My God, <laughs> isn't it? A little bit. It's sweeter than anything else. I guess maybe some like real Puerto Rican rum is super sweet. I mean, of all the liquors, it's made of sugar. That is true. So I think of it. Maybe I'm just like. Maybe that's totally wrong, but I just feel like if it's made of sugar, it's probably the sweetest of the liquors. I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. Oh, my God. But, I mean, but speaking of events, it's like that was – looking at that model that they did for that was super impressive. Like they just popped up and they had people lining down the block. Yeah. Like that's insane. Yeah, this is kind of like uh, like kind of like what Charlie's doing with his Funland productions. He just did like uh, – um, 
a Valentine's, Valentine's Day thing. And like it had like a real like demon cupid love advice lounge. I didn't make it. It was cool. It was very well put together in the sense of like the characters were very developed and the experience of like having a demonic cupid give you bad love advice was <laughs> interest genuinely interesting. Um, and so I think what they've done really good is developed like a theatrical performance that's interactive. That's very cool. And uh, that's why like Funland at Hole in the Sky was interesting because they created like a Disney World type experience or like carnival type experience um, where which is built on like live performance by which is it is impressive to or, it's so impressive to organize that yeah oh yeah like the amount of organization to get other people to mess with and like to agree on your idea is really hard yeah well those guys come from like a theater background so i oh, think God. you know how like the drama kids the drama kids start early <laughs> in terms of like collaborating creatively yeah um like decades of experience probably at this point i mean i feel so bad because charlie has done some amazing events but i've routinely missed them all and i feel so bad because uh, they're always like it just never worked out for me like the valentine's day one i was single i'm not gonna go to that like it was still cool it wasn't necessarily for couples well to me it was still hard because i'm like man i want to go there alone like, and plus it was all the way out in alexandria and so you have to like really want to go all the way out to alexandria yeah but fun land i really messed with that idea because i just thought it was cool the concept was amazing it was just only one night which is like most things these days mm -hmm. but I, I think i had like a gig that night or something yeah i have like an idea that i want to try to figure out how to do and i'm calling it artisanal mini golf and basically like I just want to make like mini golf holes that are just like de designed by individual artists to be like fun. <laughs> That's sick. And like, it's basically kinetic sculpture and interactive kinetic sculpture. Like, and I feel like you can make sculptural things out of like paper mache. I've seen Charlie do it and like you can get scale of things pretty cool. And then everyone knows how to play mini golf. So like anybody can do it. And I feel like there's tons of ways you can execute on it. I feel like the Cheshire would be a perfect place to like install yeah. an artisanal mini golf course. But that'd have to be for like a month. Like. I know. Like that's the problem is like it kind of needs to start out as like a small scale proof of concept of like one hole. And like that's part of like a group art show where there's like tons of other stuff going on. That's and then so like cool. if people really like the artisanal mini golf, then figure out how to like expand the concept to include more artists and figure out how to make it work in a sense of like maybe it's not at a single venue but maybe it's sort of distributed to like several venues that have like enough space within each of them to like tuck a like see golf but, ho hole but in. that makes me think of is did you experience the future of sports exhibition that came through i did not so that was an interesting model, and it was very similar to how bands approach touring, which, uh -huh. which is how I think a lot of artwork takes cues from, is how it's like a traveling show. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like something like that could easily be like a traveling pop-up experience, the same way they came into 21 Rooms, the same way Future Sports came. It's like yeah. they take this concept, and they move it to different cities, which is something that I really like the idea of as like someone producing events where if I built that angle to a big enough brand, a big enough platform if i come to your city you know about it you know what i'm saying so it's yeah. like like in but even then i don't know about the future sports brand but they took that and they went to different cities the same way 21 rooms did yeah it's like a traveling experience almost like a traveling circus show yeah another one that we've hosted at hole in the sky in the past was um the national poster retrospecticus um oh. that this dude jp boneyard um organize and i think still organizes but it was basically a traveling um, silkscreen poster show that he would have like 400 posters in like a like kit that he would just like travel around in a van with and then in a single night like put all the posters up on the walls of like a gallery and then like have a show and then take it down the next day and travel off to the next city. That's cool. I love yeah, that. Yeah, he like toured with it and 
that was very inspiring to me like early on when I was started organizing the hole in the sky art shows. Cause like I started organizing them and then I saw like he was doing this cool thing. And then like I reached out to him about like doing it at hole in the sky and it was like ended up happening. So Whoa. I mean, it's very much like how like punk bands set up their tours and shit like that. It's just like, but this was for visual art in a way that I hadn't really experienced a ton of like touring visual art shows. How do you feel about that concept on a large scale? Like think about like, uh, like Coachella, but for visual art, I mean, they have art fairs. They have like super fine that just started happening in DC. And then they have like other big art fairs, but I don't know. I guess Art Basel would be the closest to the biggest. Art Basel, yeah. That's probably the closest That's to the, the biggest. Coachella of art. Yeah, at this point, Coachella. right? Yeah, because it's like the most mainstream and like well-known. And yeah, I'd say that's totally it. Yeah. But do you think like an art show could be something like that where it was a traveling thing like a Lollapalooza or like a Vans Warped Tour where it was this fairground experience and people paid to come? Like, do you think I that could... like Vans Warped Tour was like the only thing like that that Vans traveled Vans like was, yeah that was because so Lollapalooza didn't really travel right like and Coachella doesn't travel and or Rolling Loud which one Rolling Loud travels it's a it's it's rap based oh, okay cool but I think like kind of how modeling after a punk show is more on a small scale but modeling after like a, a festival circuit yeah. or like an EDC or like a, a, a Rolling Loud or like a Warped Tour how that sort of travels and it brings that kind of culture with it. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like that is a tough sell. <laughs> is it? Are, are there even artists that big who could even do that? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah seems, I don't know. That seems kind of hard, right? I mean, I'd say it's totally possible. I just don't know. I just don't know how. Like, with music just has like so much more like mainstream popularity to support that kind of scale. It's a different animal. Yeah. People like you can consume music infinitely like, but you can't consume visual art in the sense of like buying it infinitely. Cause you don't have like infinite wall space or like, I see what you're saying. Yeah. And like your taste in like visual art, like, doesn't as much like represent you as like your taste in music i don't know it's like for visual art to have the same sort of like cultural place as music yeah i don't know if that'll ever happen or i mean maybe digital stuff makes that more possible maybe. the closest thing i could think of is raw artist yeah and i don't really like that i don't like it either it seems very exploitive yeah and there's like pancakes and booze like those kind of i things. don't like that shit either yeah. It seems like the art was a side thought. Like it was just sort of like an attraction. Like it wasn't. It's like, that's how you, it's like you use the artist to ensure that people come out because like the artist, like it's the same thing as like the group show model yeah. of like getting people to come out. It's like more of the marketing scheme of it than the like reason why it's cool. That's exactly, it seems more like a marketing scheme because yeah. they will email every freaking artist in the city Yeah, and be like, pay us $200 to be a part of our event. And yeah. then. After you pay us $200, the guests have to pay $30 to come in, and then you better hope they buy your art. I know. I'm like, that's a bad model for an artist. Yeah, it's pretty, it feels pretty exploitative or exploitive. I, yeah, I've, it's always felt weird. I never really liked this. I never liked that shit either. Yeah. But I mean, for the people who are running those events, they've created a model that seems to work. Yeah. It's but, just not the one that but I But the like. reason, like, I, I want to have you on the show is, like, one, we can talk the nitty-gritty about this shit, which is awesome because I have no one else to talk about these ideas with. Mm -hmm. Like, you actually have way more experience about this stuff than I do, which I think is amazing, you know? And I appreciate your knowledge on that. But it's, like, you, you're one of the few people in the city providing something different to the public, you know? Like, there's not many people who you can identify as as, as providing this sort of experiential thing, especially around arts, like... You know what I'm saying? Like, you can name them on your hands. It's yeah. There's not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no Kings is probably at the top because they have crazy funding. Like you and all the events you do, Charlie and he's kind of involved with you. And mm -hmm. then me, who's doing stuff. I'm coming up. But besides, and then maybe like Hen House. Yeah, Hen House looks like what they've been doing. It's bigger than anything I've ever done. Dude, Hen House has been popping. Yeah. 
yeah but besides that it's kind of like that's it yeah there's other like small things that pop up but in terms of like people who are consistently doing it oh thank you i think you're right there it's yeah i'm i am disappointed by like how there isn't more i mean you've got things that are like politically motivated too like monolith uh you know you know joe i love joe yeah he should we even say his name (laughs) (laughs) i know oops no he's got i feel like he's got that in his like instagram whatever whatever not blowing up your spot yeah (laughs) but um him and shawnee are organizing a thing a bernie show like are you serious yeah but that's but that doesn't feel that feels like a one off as opposed to sure like a collective or, or people doing things routinely and over time. Yeah, and I know that there are people who are trying to figure that out, and I think it is like the hard part is like having a space that you can consistently put something on. I mean, like Amir is doing a pretty good job of like regularly hosting shows, but it's this big, <laughs> like you can't like do huge things because you could fit like 10 people in here and then like everyone just ends up having to spill out like yeah but but uh, that's his vibe that's like the point it's perfect for like this size thing uh and then it's like yeah once you hit that like a level up where it needs to be a little bit bigger there isn't like a lot of people organizing for that specifically yeah it was cool like the sheet cake show the fact that um slim's diner like uh nick was able to like get the use of the space upstairs as like a gallery because i thought it was actually like a really nice little space for like that size show and i enjoyed I loved it. for more shows to have happened there but it like burned out real quick but like slim's shut down like the owners like closed it it's and, literally just sitting there yeah i drove by yesterday i was like oh there was she cake yeah, it'd be it'd be cool if someone like made it so that like shows could still happen in that upstairs space. You know, I actually tried contacting those people like, uh-huh. a year ago, uh-huh. and not to do a show, but to like have like a studio, and they threw some number at me. I was like, nope, mm-hmm. peace out. I was like, all right, that's ridiculous. That's too bad. It's hard to find space. I'm trying to think of anything that I know about right now. Yeah, well, space. I think the Pack Social guys, the Cheshire. Yeah, are you familiar with what they're doing? What they got new plans? I haven't been talking to them lately. Yeah, I mean, maybe I don't know how well you bonded with Ma or or uh, uh, Amy mm-hmm. people, but they're essentially a startup. Like the Cheshire isn't really their spot. They're building this online platform for people to find venues, and yeah. they're like, kind of activating through developers and different things. Uh, so, like you said, it's more approachable for people to do events. Mm-hmm. My only qualm with that is, is that how many people can actually have a successful event? Yeah. Like, how many shitty events are you going to get before someone's like, oh, I had enough of this? Yeah, it's tricky. It's, like, real tricky because to, like, to do a good event takes a lot of different variables, like, working out. It does. And, like, practice doing that. And I've been lucky enough that, like, a lot of the variables, like, automatically worked out because, like, Hole in the Sky was the space where I was doing it. So a lot of those variables were, like, locked in. Mm. But, like you still have to like think about a lot of things and marketing is a huge part of it. And like, it's actually the most important part. It of is it the for, most important part. Events. Like you could have a really fucking cool event that nobody comes to because like, you just didn't let them know. <laughs> like, and, and that happens all the time. Yeah. And it's not so bad to like come to an event that, was promoted to be like cooler than like when you get there it is like because like sometimes it's about like letting people's imaginations blow up an idea in their head and then but hopefully like you're impressing people when they come to the thing that like you promoted hopefully you promoted a thing accurately well it's like a weird thing because it's like if you if you have a dope brand on it people are probably going to come out if you like someone cool attached to it but if you if you have a shitty marketing approach and a, and a shitty flyer, yeah, no one wants to come. Yeah, yeah, I've been lucky enough that like I've been able to make all the flyers for my things, so I don't have to worry about having like a shitty flyer because I know the flyer that I'm gonna make is a flyer that I would want to like 
go to the show. It's I so see. important. The flyer is so important. Yeah. I mean, I'm always looking at flyers on bulletin boards and at coffee shops and stuff like that just because that's how I get a sense for like the local sort of more underground culture because that's just one of the avenues through which like they promote like the little things that they're doing to like like-minded people. Ah, uh-huh, yeah. You know, I just like try to put flyers and posters at all the places I like to go because hopefully the places I like to go, there's other people who are like me who go there too. And like, well, be drawn to the flyer that I made. Is there a marketing strategy you find that works for you? Yeah. I mean, it's a combination of like the hole in the sky email list, which is just sort of like built up over time. But there's the, like in the lead up to the show, um, even sort of start showing some initial sketches of the flyer just to build, Mm -hmm. uh, anticipation for the, like, official announcement of the show that's happening with like the actual flyer and then continue to follow that up with um, like examples of things that people will see. Like, so that's all like the online strategy and like, Oh, so you actually drop like samples and ideas of what people might see. Yeah. Um, Just to give people a sense for what they'll experience and also just like make sure that they know far enough in advance, like, at least two weeks before the show that it's happening so that they can get it in, in their calendar. Yeah. But then like yeah. use that two week period to like really reinforce and remind, uh, up until the point of the show. It seems like two weeks out is the sweet spot. Yeah. Anything you do before two weeks out, no one gives a fuck. It's pretty, should be pretty casual and low key and yeah. not like your main push because it would be it would effectively be wasted energy because it's far enough away that like yeah you might get people paying attention and listening but then it's going to escape from their memory in the period between then and the actual show so i've always found that like i'm not stressed about like not getting promotion up um unless it's like within the two week window and i haven't gotten promotion up like yeah i found that too it's like even now after we discuss all this, I'm definitely going to change the model of how I'm approaching the show. Mm-hmm. No one's even bought a ticket yet. People just know about it, but no one even cares this far out. Like yeah. we're a little bit more than a month out. No, no one cares. Yeah. Two weeks from the show, you start seeing the RCPs. Yep. Week before the show, create RCPs. Three days before the show, yeah. everyone's like, this is what we're doing. And yeah. then like the day of and the day before the show are just insane. Yeah. And you need to build that swell up. Yeah. Like it doesn't just come out of nowhere. Like it is the like building of like the anticipation, like the two weeks in advance that gets you there. I know. It's so it's totally it. Yeah. And then I also like to reinforce like the digital execution with physical on the ground materials. That's so important. Like flyers at coffee shops and record stores and then and bars and um and then wheat paste uh on like electrical boxes and things around the city so like Mm. those aren't the way that i expect people to find out about the show um necessarily like the core base of people i expect to like find out through like the hole in the sky email and like through social media but i also expect those people to get a second hit of that if they're like at a coffee shop and they see that they're like oh yeah the thing i saw online is also in the real world and so like i'm thinking about it twice now and so the more like different touch points that you can hit people with the more likely they'll remember it as the day comes draws closer yeah my market strategy is very much the same where it's like the online organic shit then you have your email list which i've been building so i have like i think i have like over 400 people now not bad that's good um yeah i discovered that feature on eventbrite <laughs> oh yeah I just, literally oh, man. I, you didn't know and then you found out yeah like, literally oh shoot i didn't know and then and then for henry's show i was like oh wait i have over 300 people here i was like whoops yeah that's like, perfect could have used that for my show i know and then oh it sucks i know dude i know oh it sucks and, and so it's like it's the organic instagram shit the facebook event the eventbrite organic mm-hmm. but then for paid i'll do like instagram ads yep. Uh, Facebook ads, yeah. story ads. Yeah. Uh, and then the thing that I found, like the guerrilla marketing, the street marketing, yeah. is like the places around where the place is going to be. 
yeah really was key like hitting all of 18th street and hitting those coffee shops and hitting the restaurants and stuff just hey can i post this fire here yeah especially like within the community that the event is going to be like that was the most crucial because then it feels like the community is supporting the event like Mm -hmm. especially if you have it your flyers up at the local businesses around town and like people who frequent those businesses are also the people who are more likely to go to the venue that your show is at so yeah i mean you definitely want to try to draw people from elsewhere but like there's a lot more legwork involved in that there and is, you need to dude. be able to invest like more money in that and that's like leveling up to a different point but like the like very affordable marketing strategies that like we've just talked about anybody could do and like those facebook ads are like easy to do and not that expensive and you can get good reach to people who you don't know like that's the most important part about it and then like just making sure that you've got it on all the platforms where people share stuff like facebook and eventbrite because eventbrite's great because it just like gets it in its listing and so you um just get more eyeballs on the dude thing. i need to say this before i forget it you yeah know what blew up henry's event what we got picked up by brightest young things yeah like getting picked up by the local mailing list and yeah. the event distributors that was what put it over the edge oh yeah 730 dc as well is a good one it was picked up by 730 and it was picked up by uh by things but did you put out like press releases to them or did you like henry, submit to their uh we submitted to 730 and i don't know how henry got it picked up on brightest young things because there's one way that you can like pay to be on the listing for brightest young things and then sometimes they'll just like preview your event and like no we just, didn't pay them yeah then like you just got picked up because they thought it was interesting so like yeah getting on local media is important too no because, but at the show i was asked well, how'd you find out about this event yeah. you know me being brightest young things dude that's cool everyone who didn't know henry that was their first answer i was like oh shit like this is important yeah and like it's very important to like maintain good relationships with those like uh publications just because like it gives you access to the audience that they maintain like that's their job that's what they do and like uh it's great when like they're they what you're doing resonates with them enough to like share it with like their people yeah. Well, you know, enough about the events. So I, feel, I feel like we had like the primer on events. I was like me asking all the questions I always had. Sure. Can we talk about you as an artist and the fact that you draw tattoo inspired shit, but you don't give tattoos? Sure. <laughs> How does that happen? Oh, it's just because I started like getting tattooed. And, uh, and like when you're getting tattooed, you're um, around a lot of like tattoo artists and you're watching them work and you're looking at like they're like what inspires them Mm -hmm. and you're figuring out like how designs are like designed for the purpose of like being tattooed and uh and like i found a lot of what the craft of and tradition of tattooing is was very resonant for me like resonated with me like as somebody who like in silkscreen printing, like that's a craft that has a lot of similar like rules and like yeah. things that define like why you would design thing in a particular way based on like the craft of it, the mm-hmm. the material and how it works. And I've like always been like cartoony in my style. And I've like grew up uh reading calvin and hobbes and like being inspired by that calvin and hobbes yeah and like the art style on that was very cartoony but also somewhat realist sometimes and like watercolor painting and just like really beautiful uh and then i always loved like teenage mutant ninja turtles and the simpsons and you mean the rules as far as like some things that translate for a tattoo and translate on the skin are different than the same thing with like silk screen how the, like, you think this design aspect might work, but it won't because of the parameters of that of that art form or medium. Yeah, like that kind of thing, and also just like the order in which you apply color uh, versus like lines. Mm. Uh, it's actually like the opposite between tattoos and silkscreen printing. With like silkscreen printing, you put all your colors down first, and then you put your like outline on last and that's like your key layer and that's the thing that makes it all suddenly look right um but then with tattoos you put the dark outline in first like you put your outline in first in black and then you do like shading 
because like that's the strongest like pigment and that's basically just creating barriers for all the color uh that you're gonna put in afterwards to keep it from like um blurring out or like oh that's a real thing like you put the black because of that purple or that yellow might actually bleed outside of it if it's not there yeah like oh whoa like black stays more than other inks just because it's got like a denser like spectrum like whatever yeah the science of ink is like and the way it reacts to skin over time like black ink is the one that uh will maintain its form the longest because everything migrates over time and that's why like old people's tattoos now look like fuzzy because like the ink just migrated and so you design tattoo designs with the fact that they will age in mind like that's the american traditional style at least and like that's the one that inspires me the most um because like i just like the look of it i like the tradition of it i like the imagery um and i like that it was kind of like a thing you did when you were traveling like you picked up souvenirs um to help you remember things um and just to be like hard <laughs> i but your your art style is very inspired by the american tradition of tattooing because literally when i was at your your solo show i literally i don't know if you remember me telling you i was like i was like i was like mike if you were literally giving tattoos right now i would get one like i was like i love your shit like i would get this tattooed on me yeah and like to become a tattoo artist is a very lengthy oh, involved God. process yeah. to do it right and like a lot of people do it when they're like a lot younger and you have to go through an apprenticeship. Do you really think if you picked up a gun that you would be bad at it? I think you'd be pretty good at it personally. I might be all right at it, but like I would not want to go about like making a career out of true tattooing by starting that way. True. It would be disrespectful. To the art form? To the craft. Oh, to tradition. The craft. Yeah. To the art form, sure, but I I don't think a lot of tattoo artists think of it in terms of like it's more of a craft form, but as like the craft and the they trade. are very particular about that yeah i mean because it started more of like a trade and a craftsmanship than mm-hmm. like uh artistry mm. and it's i feel like it's more recently that like people started thinking about it as an art form and like i think people probably thought about it like that a lot more like within like the tattoo like culture but like that's kind of how craft is like there's beauty in like craft and the artistry of craft and like Mm. that's the thing that like when we talk about the economics of art and like how you'd like would do organize an art show to like make money and stuff like that i have a lot of respect for like tradespeople who have just like honed their skills and like have a profession that like is well defined and that like people want and takes a lot of time to get good at and tattoos are like one of them that really is people can make a good living doing and they can like find work anywhere for the most part and there's like a community of it but through that the craft tattooing has become an art form like like the americana stuff that you're inspired by and like and i've seen you've been you were what is it? The recent stuff on your Instagram, you've been like practicing on the on the book of some American guy. What do you, what is that again? Yeah, it was this book that my girlfriend Rachel got me. Um, it was just like a book that this dude G. E. Larson, who's from like New Jersey, and he's like in his seventies now, but in his like heyday, he was tattooing like in the seventies, and like he had a bunch of cool designs in this book and. Uh, like a lot of tattoo designs are built off of like designs that someone else did before. Mm. Like, and so like the likes of Ed Hardy is probably one of the most well-known, well, like actually to go farther back, like Sailor Jerry is probably one of the like more oh, wow, well-known yeah. names. Um, and there's like other artists that a lot of the contemporary people like, uh, are inspired by or like learned from like there's such an interesting tradition in tattooing of like apprenticeship and like passing on 
like the skill set and like the stories and everything of like what you've experienced as like a tattooer to like the next generation of people. Uh, and like, there's something that's super cool about that. And also like, I, that's why I would feel, uh, disrespectful to like jump into just getting a machine. No, I totally tattoo. get it. I totally get it. But it seems, think, yeah. it seems like the sailor Jerry in, in the, the guy you just mentioned, I can't, who you just said, who you're, who you're practicing from. Sorry, I forget his name. Um, uh, his like nickname is Lumpy. Yeah, Lumpy. It seems like they set the standard for that style in a way where it's like it, it seems like that's very like the fundamental in a way. I don't like Lumpy did not set the standard, but like I continued like, the standard, and okay. like that's the thing that's really cool about American traditional is that like it all looks the same, but like you know different artists based on like the quality of their line work like mm. two people can do the exact same design and you'll know which one is which it's all about the line work i feel like i, I from, from what i've collected over watching videos over time yeah because it's very difficult to apply a good tattoo because the machine is vibrating you have to like get the needle into the appropriate depth for the ink to like stay in the skin and not blow out and like that's hard to do <laughs> i have no idea i've never done anything like that yeah and so like it's very interesting that like two people handling the same exact type of machine or actually like everyone's machines they like modify a little bit to like their particular liking like, like different grips and stuff right yeah the way they hold it or like the speed that they use like the size needle that they like to use for lining and shading and stuff like that. So oh, there's all those little variables. Like the width of how many needles are on it and stuff like that, right? Yeah, because some will function more like a brush and some will f function more like a liner. Oh, so almost like how you have differences in pens. Yeah. Like you might absolutely. have a Sharpie, but they might have like a fine Sharpie. Then you might have like a square tip Sharpie. Yeah. And like for the flash sheets that artists will do, the watercolor paint, and so they'll use like a liner brush for the black outlines, but then they'll use like a like wash to do like black fades. And then they'll just use like a more of a fill brush for like colors. And oh. so the like actual brushes kind of simulate the tattoo machine mm -hmm. like needle experience when it comes to how you like apply the color and how you like move the machine. So like, that's how you kind of practice your like designs. I think oh. this is all me learning just based on like what I've observed, not yeah. what someone has told me necessarily. Yeah. I mean, that's all we have to go by. I mean, unless you're actually giving them that's different, but yeah, like I'll, I'll sign me up, dude. I'll, I'm talking, <laughs> sign me up, man. I'll get some shitty Americana tattoos by you any day, even if they probably look amazing. I'm, <laughs> I'm there, dude. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it would be so cool to be able to do that. Um, but I have to figure out the right way. To not be disrespectful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I wanted to do it, if I was going to do it, I would want to do it right. Do you actually see yourself doing it? I mean, it would be a very big career change, but it would be really... It's some, it's something that seems viable, like, mm. in a way that, like, is comforting, in a way that, like, <laughs> other things just... Other things that, like, I've worked in, like, advertising and stuff, just some feel like bullshit sometimes. You've and, worked like, in advertising? Yeah, that was, like, my main job for, like, the last several years. What happened? Uh, the shop closed down because they had corporate ownership. That's all, like, not interesting uh, yeah, no, details. But, but, but I'm curious, like, like you tr did you transition to being, like, a full-time artist? Or, like, what's the situation there? Right now, I'm just, like, on sabbatical, like, post like our shop got shut down and everyone got laid off so i am currently technically laid off and unemployed but getting severance so oh, it's kind of like lit. yeah it's kind of like <laughs> vacation <can> pay, dog. <laughs> yeah it's like i never really took vacation when i was working or like never really took extended vacations so this is the first time i've had to like be on an extended vacation and not have to like do work for somebody because like i'd worked long enough that like i like saved up money and then like the severance also made it that like i was like getting a paycheck but not working and like 
that's cool. That's, um, that's fucking awesome. And it was because I worked there for so long that yeah. like it was based on like how long you'd work there. So I got like a really better deal than most, um, just because that's how it works out. So are you like figuring out your next move right now? Yeah. Yeah. So like this last two months have been like a gestation period of just like not having any pressure to like accomplish anything in particular and just like exploring what I like and what I'm interested in. That's nice. Yeah. I've been a lot less productive than I thought it would be, but it's also been like, there's a lot of different things that I'm interested in. So the main reason why I haven't felt productive is because I haven't focused on like a single thing and just Uh. like gone for it. Cause then I feel like the, the amount of like productivity would be more apparent and like clear and it would like be more focused. But I haven't felt like like, nothing's really sort of like, I mean, I've been working on things and like on Instagram, I've been posting a lot of the like sketches I've been doing, but like none of that feels like quite right as like the next project that I want to do. But I'm like fooling around with making a font out of like my handwriting style, like do doing some weird stuff with that. And then maybe just like, learning some new skills, maybe trying to pick up some 3d and like maybe, do you think you're going to try maybe leaning towards more of the artist or production side? Like are the events, like it seems like you've been doing so much of the events and experience, like you could like lean into that as far as making that a more profitable thing. It's interesting. Like I don't know. Like I don't know if I want to do that. Like, full time. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like I've never done it for like money really and there was like like, a passion project it's always just been like free time passion project and so to make it a real thing is interesting like i think part of me is just like i'm not doing it because then it becomes real and like then there's something at stake and like of course it's easier to exist in a world where nothing is at stake, but <laughs> at a certain point you got to grow up and like have something at stake. <laughs> Damn bro. You sound like you're in the right position to do some drugs. <laughs> yeah. Like, go do some psychedelics and really figure this shit out, man. Yeah. Just rewire my brain. Resort. Dude, I, I've, I've actually said it, I think a few times in this podcast, I've been like so yearning to do something like that. I actually did. I, you've heard of breath work? No. I haven't spoken on this yet in the podcast. I did breath work the other day. I dude, I tripped out, man. Really? Dude, so breath work is it, it's just wild. Like, okay. So I have a couple social media clients. I do social media work, and sometimes it's mostly photography, and, and sometimes it's video, just because whatever. But I, I did a video for this guy who does breath work classes. Okay. And I had no idea what the hell that meant. But we we finished filming his videos that were making for Instagram, and I haven't edited them yet. This was like all last week, right? That same day, this was literally like last Friday, uh, he's in town, he's from New York to teach us breath work. And this guy, he quit his job in finance and everything to pursue this path of like spirituality and breath work and guiding others, right? Mm-hmm. So I said, hey man, can I attend your class? And he said, yeah. He said, yeah, you can come to my breath work class. And I said, he said, actually, I'd love for you to be there. There's actually some space open. I said, sweet. Mm-hmm. So I get to the class and I, I don't know what to expect, but it, I'm like breathing. I'm like, what the, is this meditation? Like, is this yoga? Like, what is it? Yeah. So essentially... Like, right. I just saw people out the window. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But but essentially, you you lay down and you breathe, and you what you do is you take two breaths out and one breath in, uh-huh. and you go. Your first breath is through your stomach, and your second breath is to your chest. So it's like, so it's like, uh-huh. right. And it seems like like what does that do? But what you do is when you're laying down, you have nothing under you. You're laying down. They have some soothing music on. The lights are a little low. But if you do that for like a minute or two, you start to over oxygenate your brain. Hmm. And all of a sudden you start to go to this space where my hands started like seizing. Like they got, they got like got all tingly and numb. Like my hands were like looking like, like, like crab legs. And I, I, I couldn't move them. Uh-huh. Right. And same with my feet. They're a little tingly. Uh-huh. But then like, I felt this sensation around my jaw uh-huh. where it felt like it was just like tingly and I couldn't really feel it. In, in my mind, I'm sitting there and I, and I keep doing the breathing, the, you know, or sorry, the breathing in, then the out, the, yeah. you know, and I kept doing that and doing that. And then like around like the third or fifth minute in, you stop thinking about the people making sounds around you. you, you, you like I stopped thinking about 
my the fact that I was worried about my hands are gonna be frozen like this. Uh-huh. I started like going within myself, and I was like, "What the fuck? Like, where am I going on this trip?" Uh huh. And I started thinking about like relationships with my family, like my purpose, like thinking about like closeness to my mother, uh-huh. and like how like I kind of feel like I need to be out in the woods and shit. And I started like kind of tripping out. Like okay. it felt like the time I did mushrooms in a weird way, but like a little more you know different. And I just kind of kept it going down this hill and you, you do it for like 28 minutes and it seems like a long time to be breathing, but it seems short when you really get into it. And I was like, like I, I cried at one point, not like weeping, but just like Ugh. tears came down my face. Ugh. Like I couldn't move my hands. Like I'm like, and then it's over. Like it, then it's, and you, you kind of come out of it and you have to relax. Like my hands were like seizing. He put like stones in my hands while I, they were like frozen like oh, that. Uh-uh. And like that's a little more spiritual than like hot stones or no, it's like like stones. rocks, like rocks, like, oh, like okay. gems or something. Yeah, and like crystals. Yeah, crystals. Yeah, crystals. <laughs> you know, yeah. energy, bro. Like I'm not even into that shit. And I was like, whoa! Like I left there feeling lighter. Like I felt like I had a thing to do. Like I I felt a little more grounded. Mm. And it was all just through this experience of breathing. It's pretty wild. It was wild, dude. Yeah, it was wild. Yeah, maybe it was just like you were dying, <laughs> <laughs> like over oxygenating your brain, yeah. like you're hyperventilating like, or right, something. You're gonna die a little, <laughs> and so that's gonna induce some hey. weird stuff. Hey everyone, we're gonna kill ourselves yeah. for thirty minutes. All right, everybody, hold your breath for thirty minutes. But dude, no, dude, but since then, I still feel a little bit more at ease. That's e- good. Even since then, like I, I that following weekend, I went out to the woods, went on like a little hike, and I don't ever do that shit. Hmm. But I did, and I thought, and I had some great thoughts. Like, it was actually, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I like uh, those kind of experiences that you feel like you come out the other end a little bit different on and, like, appreciate things a little bit more because of, like, and I like being outside and, like, not wearing headphones and stuff. Yeah. Just sort of being present in the places that I am feels good. And I, f- I don't know. Not a lot of people really do that. <laughs> it's freaking weird. Like when you're in public and you're like, I am the only one that is not looking at my phone right now amongst everyone that is here. It's a weird feeling, eh? Like I am the only one looking up and I'm the only one who will be able to like avoid something that was coming <laughs> our way. <laughs> I would see it first and I would get out of the way. <laughs> everyone else would just be unaware. Or like on the Metro, everyone's on their phone. Yeah. It's too bad. But then again, it makes it easier to, as me, like, to be more like an urban voyeur or, like, what is it, a flaneur? Like, somebody who just observes people while amongst people. Like, it's a lot easier to observe people because none of them are, like, looking back at you. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, now everyone's just looking at their phone and they won't, like, make that weird eye contact. Yeah, with like, you. I'm the only one looking around and, like, the ratio of other people who are looking down is so low that like my eyes aren't going to like make contact <laughs> with anybody. It's really interesting. That's really interesting. Cause I'm probably, I'm definitely one of those people who's looking at their phone. I'm like looking around and I'm listening to everything because it's a right around me. Are you scared to wear headphones in public? Like you feel vulnerable? Yeah. I don't like wearing headphones in public. Like what we're wearing these cans. I would never wear this in public. I would never do that. The only time I would wear like, ear pods like my ear pods air pods would be like when i was we- if i'm wearing a beanie and i can like have my air pods like under my beanie so that people can't see that i'm wearing air pods where do you wear like someone's gonna run up and steal them no i just like think it looks corny <laughs> like walk around wearing headphones <laughs> dude that's what all the kids do now like it's like a it's like a statement to have a ear bot ear bot in or air pod sorry yeah i don't know i i am not addicted to my technology in the way that i see other people as addicted to theirs like jealous i don't have like any of my like notifications turned on and i try to like just combat like this phone thing like affecting my like presence in place like this thing doesn't matter as much as like what's going on around me how'd you get to that space I don't know. <laughs> you just you just like don't like that. Like you're. Still- I hate like having to like respond to my phone. Oh, it is the true. expectation that I would instantly react to someone pinging me. <laughs> like, 
fucking be right next to me and I'll like give you my full attention. And then they have the expectation of you being there so quickly. All of that. No, like just because you can instantly reach me doesn't mean I have to instantly reach you back. Like why should I have to move that fast for somebody else? That's so true. I don't like, like why? Like it doesn't make it any sense because it's because like, we're like in this instant gratification world where it's like if people are so used to you dm someone they're gonna see it within five minutes and they're gonna respond you know and yeah, no one's got any patience right. and like yeah i feel that in myself where like there's like oh, why haven't they gotten back to me yet but i've gotten a lot more used to just like well first of all i've established with like all the people who i communicate with a pattern of not responding immediately to them unless it's urgent. Damn, your girl must get really upset. I live with her. Okay, that's different then. Yeah. And she's also someone she who, it. like, if it's urgent, like, I'll be, like... Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah it's a difference. It's a difference. Yeah, it is our it's strangers on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. It's like anybody, like, yeah, there's levels to it. Yeah. You have, you have to understand your priorities. Yeah. <laughs> dude, no, I feel you, dude. So I turned off my Instagram notifications a couple months ago. But you probably know it's even worse. What? Now I'm like, instead of checking for notifications, because I was like, why the fuck do I care if I'm getting a notification of a like? That's so stupid. Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. I turned it, I turned all that off, so I don't even care if someone, I don't even get a notification someone DMs me, nothing. Yeah. But now I'll go on Instagram being like, did someone DM me? Like, yeah. I'm like, I'm so the person you hate. I am literally that person. Yeah, but at least it like, uh, you, you have like, put it in its own little space a little bit more instead yeah. of allowing it to constantly chip away at like your personal space that's very true because like that's what you want to do on instagram is see what's up and like but you've made it so that you only have to do that when you open instagram not like when it's closed and like you're not trying to look at it like dude now that i think about it i haven't felt the phantom vibrate in forever yeah, i completely you, forgot about that concept yeah i've turned off like even that like yeah that little number badge on icons like i don't want to like see like even like oh there's this many things that require your attention like what do yeah. you mean the number badge on icons you know the little red dot oh i hate that shit yeah which it can be like an ego boost if like you post something and then you see like a cool number like on that thing but it's it's just like another form of notification like gratification from not being inside of the app that's coming at you and trying to draw you in i've been loving the no likes view on my instagram i don't know if i've been on instagram and realized that was happening i you, don't know you if didn't mine, know that i don't know if mine does that right now i think the older accounts some of them still show or it shows you the amount of likes but i know when i made the that's the angle account yeah uh, i it doesn't show how many people like when i'm on that account and looking at even my account other people's accounts yeah i can't see how many likes it just says like uh, this person's name and others have liked the account no, like I'm it's no longer like 54 likes uh, wait oh wait no i'm still seeing like how many likes other people's stuff has gotten oh man. but that's the thing right it's like now it's not you don't see how many likes someone else's stuff has gotten mm -hmm. you just like it or you don't and move on right yeah i guess maybe i'm just dude i honestly think like in the future they're gonna get rid of like that public knowledge of views and likes and and stuff like, I think comments will always be a thing, uh -huh. but you ever think about on, on like a web page, they never let you see how many people visited that web page, right? But on YouTube, they let you they see. They used to. Like, really? Or that used to be a feature of like early internet was like the number of visitors. But but like, counter the, on but the, the public, that, oh, 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 that counter. It would but, be but, like a, yeah, counter at the bottom of the But websites. now like no websites have that. And, yeah. and, but on your, on my YouTube video, I'm going to see 17 people viewed this and then the public sees 70 people view this and then they determine the value of this conversation off of that. Yeah. I kind of hate that. And I think about it. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like, that's the thing about platforms that are built on like content creators is that like, it kind of has to figure out a way to quantify things for people. I don't know why. Like you see the value in the number or something like, oh, it has half a million views. It must be valuable. Yeah. It must have relevance to me. Yeah. That's like, that's a identifier of like quality on the internet or like something like that. 
Right. But there are other ways to accomplish that too. And like the internet is changing in very interesting ways now. Who knows what it'll look like five years from now. Well, I think because of how the infancy of the internet, it's like we're realizing that this actually has mental impact on people. The fact that you can measure these direct things and that people are validating their self-worth or measuring their self-worth off of these numbers. Yeah. When that doesn't necessarily let you know the actual quality of it. Yeah. It's a hard one. I mean, it's weird. Yeah. And it's only become so immediately accessible because of like the technology that we have right now. So true. But yeah, I think it should be very interesting even like the next year or two to see how things shake out. And also to see like how people will experience like the election, like through media that they experience. Cause some people don't watch TV anymore. It just like, I don't. Yeah. And so like, where do you get your news? It's from shit people repost. It's from Twitter trending. It's from uh, YouTube recommended. Uh huh. Do you read me. a newspaper? Like, no, I don't. Not at all. I read the New York Times because, like, I feel like I have to. To like have like a. You think that like provides value to your life? Yeah. Really? It's like the thing I read every day. Like when you wake up. Yeah. What do you like about that whole thing? Uh, it's like the most renowned journalistic institution of print journalism. More than the Washington Post? Yeah. Oh, wow. In terms of like a national newspaper, mm-hmm. like the national coverage and global coverage is like the best. Um, so it's worth it to me. Like I'm a subscriber, like just because... I went to school for journalism and like, Oh shit, you did. Yeah. I went to university of Maryland and like worked on the school paper there, the diamond back and did internships and learned about how to be a print journalist. So I have a real respect for the institution of journalism and the, the, the companies that are producing it. And I like to pay for it because I appreciate it. How do you feel now that that whole field is evolving to the sort of a more, clickbaity headline driven thing um i mean it's not good that that's the current state of how like the journalism industry has had to deal with the internet as a content proliferation platform like Mm -hmm. used to be you had to print it and deliver it and like yeah that was the bottom line that it was pretty universal and like there are different ways that people were doing that, but you still have to print it and deliver it. And now, like, you don't have to print it to deliver it. Nope. <laughs> like, so there's a lot of different ways you can deliver it. Uh, and like, there's a lot of different ways that you monetize that. And like, the ways that we measure like the success of content are skewed based on the habits that people have when they engage with content on the internet so yeah like having a good title yeah like the your article stuff is like more a product of the like analytics than like of like a good creative idea or a good journalistic structure like it's wild that a journal a journalist could spend a year covering something mm. And then it all boils down to this one article, but they get the headline wrong and no one fucking reads it. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Like if it's a valid enough story, like the headline will help sell the story. But like True. if it's a good story, people will tell other people about it. Yeah. I mean, that's true. That's true. I mean, I don't have much. It's, But you are right about how like people get rewarded for good work. Like that story, like a bad headline can sink a story like (laughs) can make a story like not be successful because nobody saw it or like because nobody clicked on it because it wasn't didn't seem interesting enough in the moment that they like saw the headline so like that's sort of like the way that we deal with the ways that people like scan through and like find things interesting yeah it's like it's like the internet media has started to influence traditional media where the people who consume them are now aging up and they have the same habits as, you know, 
internet media consuming traditional media where traditional media has to start conforming to the internet style because I worked at, dude, I actually worked at a uh, local publication out of college. It was like one of my first big boy jobs before I did this whole photography shit. Um, and I was like the digital producer there. Um, just like dealing with ad work and, and user experience on the website and stuff like that. And I was taking all of my cues and all the things they were thinking about is they were driving traffic through Facebook hmm. and Twitter. Like it wasn't through physical distribution. Like it was all very much, it seemed very YouTube inspired Yeah, in a way. Yeah. I mean, you know, like college humor dot com of course dude, that's og yeah and they just shut down recently no way like the business Bre- break model. break.com yeah yeah it's like e-bombs is that still around i don't know but like um that like model of like making content as a website is like still one that doesn't necessarily work like they had to shut down college humor and like just didn't work <laughs> like it wasn't paying the bills yeah. That's crazy. I just had a look at the time to see how long I've been chatting for. Yeah. We've been talking our face off. Yeah. That's not too bad. Holy fuck, dude. We've yeah. been talking for like two hours. How long do you typically do? I leave space, dude. Yeah. I leave space. I. It could be hour and a half. It could be two hours. I've had a couple of three hours. That's how it feels good, man. You know? I feel like we've been riffing covering some good territory yeah i'm talking about shadow but i want to talk with you man like unique yeah. things i could only talk with michael o'brien <laughs> you know like yeah. I, I had no idea you had a journalism background yeah i mean it's like is, a long time ago now is that like how you got into long. the ad world was just through journalism uh like copywriting or something no it was actually through web design like i went to school for journalism but after doing that like, or in the midst of doing that, realized that, like, I didn't necessarily want to be a journalist. Uh-huh. Uh, it was more visual. And the reason I had done journalism was because, like, in high school, I had worked on the school paper, but I was doing, like, layouts and cartoons and stuff like that. <laughs> so, like, I ignorantly uh, kind of assumed that newspapers were, and journalism was the only place you could do that. Uh, <laughs> then maybe. And Maryland was, like, in state. And so I was like, I'll just make a practical like decision around like a less costly school option that like has a good reputation for journalism and like they university of maryland had like a big student paper so like i could just continue like doing cartoons and like layout and graphics for like newspaper there and then like after school like i was graduating around the time when a lot of newspapers were um cutting a lot of staff just because the internet uh was messing up their like ad revenue. Actually, mostly Craigslist was uh, messing up like oh, classified. The classified. Ads. That's where yeah. they make all their money. Yeah, especially local papers. But um, because I realized that like I was much more visual, I also picked up a second degree in school for studio art, and so like that's when I started moving things much more like seriously towards like visual like future. And then when I graduated from school, just started like freelance web designing with a friend who was like a web developer and like I knew Photoshop and design. So like I would do the visuals and he would do the like code. Oh, whoa. Yeah. And then like that just led to me getting a job with an agency and doing like web design. And then at that agency started picking up work, doing more like content production for like brands that needed stuff for their Facebook pages and Instagram accounts and stuff like that. And so like that is what evolved into advertising over time. So oh, it's wow. kind of like a digital agency that could do anything. And then we went from a focus on like websites to more of a focus on like contents, content for brands. Yeah. It's crazy how it all evolved so fast. Yeah. It moved pretty quickly. It was like, how to understand what exactly was happening. Like, cause it was like using similar skills, but like a different thing that we were producing. And, uh, then there was just like a lot of it happening pretty quickly. So how did that company you work for just completely dissolve? What happened there? Um, the main thing is that it was bought three years ago by a corporate holding company that has, a lot of different agencies that it owns. And since the time that we were bought, that corporate holding company got 
a new CEO because oh. they're they were doing poorly. They're publicly traded. Their shares were falling. <sighs> they ousted their c- CEO and replaced him with a new CEO who um, to right the ship of the corporation decided to start consolidating all of its properties to basically trim down on costs. Like, so basically just lots of rounds of layoffs um, and taking different shops and like smashing them together. And ISL was just like one of those things where it wasn't big enough to like be worth like the, time of like a huge corporation like this that was owning it and it was like making money and doing well but like not the kind of like money that the corporate that would like do anything yeah that would like help with the main top line thing that they measure on a cupcake it was like (sighs) they didn't need it so um that uh yeah that ended they closed the shop at the end of 2019 so Wow. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah. Fucking on this path where you can do something fucking epic and I can't wait to see what you do. Yeah. It's uh it's nice having the time. I've been like very just taking my time. Well dude, Mike, I am I am hi- I am highly optimistic about whatever it is you land on. Whether it's tats, I'm there. <laughs> it's events, you know I'm gonna be there. So Yeah, I'm, I gotta figure out what the next event will be because I wanna try to do like a solo show and a group show every year. The solo show every year might be ambitious, but like the group show is a lot easier to pull off. Way easier to pull off. So if I can find a location that I want to do a thing, maybe the Cheshire again. I mean, it's like the right size and the right location and like an existing relationship that I know how to handle. It's one of the best venues I know of in the area. Yeah, and if the weather's getting nicer, the not having heating is less of an issue. Yeah, I remember the Cheshire last year or last summer. I was like, this is sick. Yeah, basically got to get it right before it gets super duper hot. For it feels like a hot, sweaty warehouse. Yeah, and like I can deal with a hot, sweaty warehouse. It's a lot easier, to, but it was like really great doing a show in November because it was like cold enough that everyone could like keep their jackets on, but because we had like enough people there, it was like nice and tasty inside hell yeah well mike i think we wrap it up there cool i gotta take a fat piss yeah (laughs) (laughs) it was a pleasure having you on man yeah all right awesome brother well guys until next time that's it that's the angle peace go check this guy out and everything he's doing it's pretty rad adios dude i didn't realize we're talking for two hours yeah that happened that happened quickly yeah yeah that was fun